Hey church family, happy Tuesday. Once again, I'm going to be bringing you the words of encouragement. You know, as a pastor or even just a follower of Jesus, one of the exciting things that we get to experience as followers of Jesus is to watch somebody turn their heart to Jesus, surrender their life to Jesus, and at the same time, show a symbol of that through baptism. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. You know, we always hear this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17. It says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. If anybody's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, right? Sounds like baptism. You know, you go into water, and when you go down, you're passing away. Your oldness is passing away. And it says, the new has come. When you rise, we always say this, when we, uh, when we bring that person up out of the water to walk in the newness of life. And it says this, um, in verse 18, all this is from God. This is a God thing, okay? And I know for a lot of us, we're probably thinking, you know, I've seen a lot of people accept Jesus Christ and, and they get baptized. And, um, but they're back in their old ways. And once again, this is... This is what we have to focus on. It says this, that uh, it says in verse 18, all this is from God. When God does the work, you will know it. And then it says this in verse um, 18, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. When we become new, now God calls us in turn to now um, bring out the good news of Jesus Christ based on our testimony of what God did in our lives. Now it's our turn, right? And then after, and not our turn, but it's still a God thing, but uh, we are now called to be his witnesses. We are now called to be light in this darkened world. And then it says this, um, uh, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We no longer have the, the sin of our old life anymore. It doesn't condemn us. Now God has given us the ministry of reconciliation or the message of reconciliation. And it says this in verse 20, therefore we are, at, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he has made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become righteousness of God. Um, one of the things when I started to read that, I started to kind of like look at certain Bible figures and or or certain uh, conversions, sort of, uh, you know, in other words, you know, what I, mean? I was looking at certain conversions in the Bible. When I flipped over to the book of Acts, chapter eight and chapter nine are two awesome conversions. The first conversion was in the book in Acts chapter 8 where Philip was called out of Samaria to go uh, uh, along this desert road and lo and behold there was a divine appointment that there was a Ethiopian eunuch that came his way and he walked with him and he encouraged him and he came alongside him and then now this Ethiopian eunuch was was like compelled about this Jesus, compelled about why he went to Jerusalem to worship. He was a seeker, in other words. And, and God called Philip to go walk alongside him. And when he walked alongside him, he was able to minister to him. Uh, he was even uh, answering some of the questions that this Ethiopian eunuch had uh, in his own life. In other words, what he was realizing is that I've been coming to Jerusalem to, to seek after this God, but I haven't gotten the, the, the questions that I came here answered. And God used this divine appointment with Philip to walk alongside this Ethiopian eunuch. And it says that in this passage um, that uh, he accepted Jesus, this Ethiopian eunuch, he accepted Jesus, he got baptized, and at the end of that passage, of that kind of, that scene, it says that, um, that the Ethiopian eunuch went back to his country rejoicing. There was, there was an internal joy, and he had a, he had a, he had a, um, divine, um, ministry opportunity that God wanted him to go back to his country and bring the gospel there. Flip over to the next chapter in chapter 9 is Saul, 
walking in pure rebellion against God, pure hatred towards God's people. And he's walking uh, towards the road to Damascus with his, with his search warrant in hand to find any Christian and put them in jail or beat them or even kill them. And God meets Saul on the road to Damascus, as we know who Saul is now Paul, right? And it says that that when Paul except when Paul met Jesus, he fell to his to his to his to the ground and and had this conversation with God. And and Jesus was saying, Why are you why are you going against me? And and at that at that moment, I believe that's where Saul realized I'm no longer gonna keep going against God. I'm gonna surrender to this God that I've been hearing. And then God appointed a, a guy named Ananias to be a part of, of Saul's journey. And then God also put Barnabas, the son of encouragement, in, in the way of, of Saul's journey to kind of re- encourage him that, hey, you're on the right track. And as we know who Saul now becomes Paul, he is now an awesome testimony of Jesus Christ and the way that he changes people. The way even if you are a seeker today. God is wanting to meet you. And if you're walking in rebellion, God is also wanting to meet you in love, even if you're against him. And when I look at these two passages, or these two scenarios of the Ethiopian eunuch, which was a seeker, and the and Saul, who was just totally rebellious and hated God and hated the things of it, you know what I mean? You see these two people, I kind of see myself smashed it into these two guys. You see, for a long time, I've been a seeker, even though I was a rebellious gang member. And and I went against everything that my mom, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I went against everything about her. And I didn't want nothing to do. But at the same time, I knew there was a God. But I, in, in times of trouble, yes, I would seek after God. I, I knew that there was a God that wanted to help me. But at the same time, I was so rebellious. And my testimony uh, came in this, this, the way that I came to Christ was this. In 1997, I, um, I was facing um, a, a drug charge. And um, they were trying to give me like three years. But lo and behold, I had two strikes when I was being convicted of this drug, tri- this drug charge. And I didn't think that because I had two strikes, any felony meant it's, an ex- it's a strike. It doesn't have to be violent or anything else. I was oblivious. I didn't know that. You know what I mean? That's how dumb a a gang member and a dumb sinner I was. Okay. So I go into court and the, uh, and the, the, uh, the DA says, uh, the County of Los Angeles wants to charge Albert Ramos with attempted, uh, with, with, uh, his third strike 25 to life. And my jaw dropped. And I was like, Whoa, what is going on? And once again, um, I was still rebellious. I, I came into that courtroom very, very uh, prideful and arrogant, thinking that three years, I just got done doing a, a, uh, a, um, a 10-year sentence and just got out a year ago. Three years wasn't nothing to me. So I remember going uh, into, after hearing that, and then I, I look back, I see my mom crying, I see my sister crying. I go into the holding tank all by myself. And I started seeking after God. And basically what I said to God was this, God, will you give me peace if you give me life? And I was basically saying to God, God, I don't want to go crazy in prison because I felt like because of my past criminal lifestyle and record, I was going to do life. I knew I was going to get out. That was just my thinking. I just knew that I was going to do 25 to life. I knew I was going to get that. And I just said to God, God, if you give me life, give me peace. I just don't want to go crazy. Just don't let my mind, you know, escape me. Let me just go into this, this, this 25 to life sentence with a, with a mindset that it won't go crazy. That's all I asked God. Praise God. I didn't get 25 to life. They gave me, uh, they gave me six years with 85%. I had to go back to prison. I did about five and some, some months. But at the same time, I didn't, I didn't just go, oh, all right, you know, I, I didn't get life, so I'm going to do my thing. No, I started to seek after God. I started to 
want to know who this God was. In other words, I wanted to know who this God was that my mom served because I seen her serve God faithfully. And I started to seek after him, just like the Ethiopian eunuch. I wanted to know everything about him because I was like Saul, I was rebellious. But you see, God doesn't care what side of the tracks you're on, what side of, of, of not knowing God you're on, he still wants to meet you. And the way that he met me is through different ways, through different, different opportunities that God has showed up even when I had to go back to prison. So I started serving God on that term in 1997 when I went back to prison. I started serving God. I just started to say to God, God, if I'm gonna follow after you, you're gonna need to show me. And I remember there was a time I, I, I was transferred to this one prison yard, started to be part of this fellowship that was on this yard. And uh, after the message happened, um, one of the, the guys, uh, the, um, the inmate uh, uh, sort of pastor guy uh, said, this Saturday, we're going to have a baptism service. And I was like, oh, one of the guys next to me goes, hey, Albert, um, have, have you ever been baptized? I was like, no, I've never been baptized. Uh, what is it all about? He, I, I even told him I'm, I was a Catholic. I was baptized. He goes, no, that's different. This is where you, you, it's a symbol, almost like what we just read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, is where we go into the water and make a decision to surrender to God. And when we come up, knowingly, when we come up, that old person is dying and the new person is living for Jesus. And I remember there was, uh, uh, a, it was on a Thursday, ser- uh, a Wednesday service. He was talking about it was going to be a Saturday baptism service. And on Friday before the baptism, I was outside of one of the dorms smoking a cigarette. And one of the guys that was sitting next to me during that service looked at me and goes, Hey, Albert, are you going to get baptized this Saturday? I was like, yeah. He goes, you know what? The thing that you're doing right now, you may want to think about asking God to remove it when you get baptized. And I looked at him, I said, you know, there's an addiction of mine. This is something I kind of like in my life, you know. And at the same time, I was like, yeah, all right, whatever, whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll, I'll reconsider. Never thought of it. Didn't even pray about it, right? But I, I remember the, the next day I go into, um, into that service and the service was good. It was, it was, it was, my heart was ready to get baptized. I wanted everything that God had to offer me. You know what I mean? I was this new, uh, wide-eyed, bushy-tailed kind of Christian. I just wanted everything that wa- God wanted me to do, right? And I remember going to get baptized. And then uh, when I went down in the water, I came back up. And uh, they, in, in, at that time, they would give you a scripture that kind of represents who you're going to be as a follower of Jesus because you have been baptized. I was given a scripture in Matthew where it says, uh, you're the light of the world, a city on top of a hill that cannot be hidden. And uh, I was like, oh, I like that. I like that. I got out of the water. I went into my dorm. I changed. And I started to walk around the yard. And I started to be like, okay, God, I'm, I'm thankful. I was happy. I was joyful. I was like the Ethiopian eunuch. I was walking and, and, and I was rejoicing. There was a, a new joy in my heart. I walked halfway around the yard and it struck me. Boom. God says, Albert, what are you going to do about that smoking? And I was like, I'm going to get rid of it. And I cut through the yard, went to my locker, and I just got went to the store about a week ago. I bought two cans of tobacco, which is, you know, we rolled it up in, in prison. I, I, I took it out of my locker, and I gave it to a guy that I came to this prison with. And I said, hey, keep it. I don't want it. I don't want nothing to do with it. If I ask you for any of it, I, I don't want it. Just keep it. And then he was shocked. He was like, what are you doing? I was like, man, I don't want it. I just don't want that. And then from that day forward, from that day, the very next day on Sunday, uh, uh, that, that day on Saturday was the last time I smoked a cigarette in 1998. And I just remember that moment where, where God just took it away. And then I had this language, you know what I mean? This kind of like this street language. I used to like to cuss and I just asked God, okay, God, if you're going to do, if you're going to start taking stuff away, I need you to take away this, this language of mine. And lo and behold, God took away this language. Cussing is not, uh, used to be my thing, but it's not my thing anymore. And I can prove it. I tell the students all the time, God has given me a language. Now he, he's taught me a new language. 
In other words, he taught me how to just speak and explain what I was feeling. Because if we were to be honest, if you got hurt, right? If you stubbed your toe, you would probably use one word to describe your whole feeling, right? It could be an F word or an S word, right? Now I remember, I remember getting hurt really bad or, uh, you know, hitting my knee. And I, the first thing you would say is like, oh, and then you say that word, right? I just remember that one time when I asked God, God, remove my language, change my language. I want my language to be a testimony of what you have done in my life. And I remember bumping my knee and all of a sudden I was like, oh my goodness, my leg hurts. And I realized God has given me new language. In other words, he gave me a vocabulary more than just that one word. And then after that, you know, uh, I tell the students all the time, I use this word when I kind of like are frustrated. I use like, let's just say, um, I stub my toe. Instead of saying that one word, I use this one word. Oh, shoesies. And you're thinking, that's a weird word. And that's kind of weird for you to say. That's my language. God has changed my language to make it kind of cartoonish. So I say shoesies. All this to say is this, guys. I believe that when God does a work, when he does a true work in your life, he's going to want change. And in our new life, we are going to just say, I surrender to what you're asking. And there's a process. Things are still dying in our life. Still, things are still dying in my life. The things that I'm still rebellious in, God is wanting it to die. And I, and I feel the conviction of a lot of those things. And that's where we get this word sanctification. I know it's a big word, but it's just a process of what God does in a person's life. And just because I accepted Jesus Christ and I got baptized, a symbol of me dying to my old self and rising up as this new person in Christ, this new person in Christ will still have the flaws. But with, this, with the flaws, with the failures, there's this Holy Spirit that comes into our life that reminds us of, Albert, that's not who I am and that's not who you are anymore. And I just wanna just say to you, if you have ever been thinking about coming to Christ, yes, you may think there's a standard that is hard to reach, but I'm gonna encourage you right now. There's a God that says, don't reach up, I reach down and I bring you there. And he brings us alongside him. And the work, once again, is not our work. We, we, we established that in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter, two, uh, chapter 5, verses 17 or 18. It says that it's God's work. That's an awesome thing. So church family, if you know anybody, or if you're listening to this today, and if you're just trying to, ju if you're just seeker like the Ethiopian eunuch, or are you the rebellious guy like Saul, God wants to have a relationship with you. And if, and if you're listening to this right now, or if you have somebody that needs to listen to this right now, I want to encourage you that you would text BELONG to 31996. This is an opportunity for you to reach out to us so we can walk you along and give you the information that you will need and the encouragement that you would, un that you would need to understand what this whole uh, uh, surrendering our life to Jesus, this relationship with Jesus and this symbolic thing of baptism is all about. Baptism doesn't save you. Our surrender to Christ does save you. When we make a confession of faith, that saves you. Baptism is a symbol of what God had already done in your surrender. So if you have still any questions, I wanna encourage you to text BELONG to 31996. And once again, June 28th at our 10, 10 a.m. service, we are having a baptism celebration. I would love to walk alongside you and encourage you. So once again, uh, text BELONG to 31996. And once again, our baptism ce celebration is June 28th at, at our 10 a.m. drive-in service. So church family, have a blessed day. Have an awesome week. And I hope to see you next Tuesday for another word of encouragement.